All right, I want to welcome everyone and acknowledge what a treat you're all about to be in for. Um, to reveal the playbook, for last year we had Dan Kahan, and this year Eric Talley. I basically used a different criteria than I did the first three years. The criteria is, who do I most want to hear give a lecture? <laughs> As some of you know, there are benefits of being a lame duck. This was one of those. And Eric and I are friends and have been for a while. We first met here in this law school when Vic Fleischer brought him for a roundtable discussion. And my reaction then and since is, this is the vision of what a legal academic should be. His intellectual rigor, his interest in understanding how the world works, looking at it through different angles, is constantly stimulating and elevating. So I invited him, and I had no idea what he was going to talk about. And he has um, delivered in his topic. Um, and for those of you who are concerned, he gives away a little bit of the punchline, which is, we still will have jobs as lawyers. <laughs> and I will say this, from my own interest in technology, this topic, whether you call it robots or artificial intelligence or what can you automate, is a really big deal for our economy. And it's a big deal for our profession. And we are so lucky to have Eric Talley, who's now at Columbia and uh, a really esteemed professor there visiting with us. So without me taking more time, turn it over to Eric. So thanks a lot, Dean Weiser, for that introduction. Uh, I don't know whether you were talking about me, but uh, I, I'll accept it. Uh, and I also want to thank the staff, students, uh, faculty at the University of Colorado Law School for having me out here. Uh, this is, as some of you know, this is sort of a home away from home for me, and I feel I have as many friends here on the faculty as I have almost anywhere else. And many, that's all right. So, and anyway, any of you I see in the audience, those who I don't see, you're dead to me. So, so this is a law school, so let me start with a legal disclaimer. Uh, I feel compelled to do so. Uh, during my career, I've, uh, I've had all kinds of different academic presentations, and, uh, and endowed lectures are kind of a, a, an interesting mix, uh, and, they're, and they're a mix you don't usually see because they combine a form of unbridled excitement with foreboding dread. And so let me just tell you a little bit about that to set things up. The excitement part comes from a, a unique opportunity to size up the field, to reflect on its past, inflect on its present, uh, and, and you know, project what its future is going to be. And it also provides a chance to set aside the usual constraints of academic discourse, where we toil in relative obscurity to make very incremental contributions to an already well-developed field. Doesn't that sound like fun? <laughs> So here you get to throw that all aside and, and go beyond the bounds of our workaday reality. And for that reason, endowed lectures are pretty cool. All right? They're also more than a little daunting for the speaker when you think about it. What are you going to say? How are you going to say it? Whom do you say it to? How do you keep your audience from nodding off when some of them invariably become bored, as I often have, with the speaker's topic or unconvinced by his or her zeal in her subject matter? And it was that latter sense of foreboding dread that caused me to seek some inspiration. And where else might I look but in my 58 predecessors in action who have delivered the Cohen Lecture here at the University of Colorado Law School. Now, fortunately, that's a pretty good data set. And you can view a lot of these lectures, including, I guess, for posterity's sake, this one online. Uh, and the ones that aren't online are actually, many of them are in print. So in I plunged. And sadly, I will confess that uh, on, on first reaction, my research yielded considerably more perspiration and trepidation than inspiration. Uh, the prior speakers in this series have been an impressive crowd. And, and they include, let me just say a couple of the folks, uh, Ruth Bader, Bader Ginsburg, the notorious RBG, Jeff Stone, Cass Sunstein, Angela Harris, William Douglas, Bill Eskridge, Martha Feynman, Al Alshuler, Alex Kaczynski, Jeff Hazard, Harry Edwards, Bob Manukin, Peter Strauss, Akilah Amar. the list goes on and on. And while this roster would no doubt be quickly dismantled were it on a basketball court in the March Madness game that you are currently missing, 
They're a bona fide dream team when it comes to another court, the judicial one. And so it's my honor to be here. And notwithstanding my initial trepidation with this roster of this dream team roster that's preceded me, I remained resolute. I stayed with it. I hunkered down uh, with the text of my oratory predecessors. And uh, most of them were, were superb. Some of them, yeah, not so good. But, but most of them were, were fantastic. And they all proved to be really instructive. After a significant analysis, I can happily report that I've unlocked what I believe to be the five secrets to a successful Cohen lecture, and they are as follows. Step one, conjure up a catchy title, like a cute metaphor or something like that. Step two, make sure that title relates to an important issue facing legal practice and education. Step three, develop an extended example to demonstrate your point, preferably one that panders shamelessly to your audience. Step four, distill a few plausible sound bite-sized insights from said example as a kind of intellectual swag for the audience members. And step five, do not, under any circumstances, exceed the time limit allowed <laughs> to the speaker. Now, be forewarned, at this stage, this five-step plan is but a theory that I've concocted in my head, but luckily, I have the opportunity to field test my theory, and you guys are my guinea pigs. So. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let's start, I guess, with my title. All right? So note that a driverless car, it's a real thing. It's a product whose legal status is non-trivially challenging. And viewed in this literal sense, in fact, legal regulation of driverless vehicles is likely to prove a profound challenge for regulators, lawmakers, judges, lawyers for years to come. And I'll talk about some of this later but for now, my focus today is going to be on the driver's, uh, driverless car as a metaphor, check off step one, by the way, for a much broader issue facing our legal profession and our system as students, educators, and practitioners. The prospects that the legal profession and the practice will be eclipsed by technological advances in data analysis, much like driving instructors, may soon be displaced by literal driverless cars. More specifically, the astounding advances in data analytics, machine learning, natural language processing, and big data over the last two decades have virtually upended the STEM world. And my central question for today, then, concerns whether the law and how the law uh, will also be upended by data analytic methods and what implications that has for practitioners, professionals, professors, and students. All right, check off step two. I'm doing well. All right. So the answers I've got, I've, I have to offer here are essentially two part answers. First, that the data analytics revolution is clearly already underway. And it's not just a gimmick conjured up by some self-serving law and technology type of person. And in fact, I am not a law and technology type of person. I teach corporate law, I teach M&A and corporate finance. The reason I came to this field is because of my realization that these issues were gonna be pretty central in, those, in that area of practice, and it already is becoming pretty central in that area of practice, all right? This revolution, moreover, shows no signs of dying down. And second, that if we're savvy about the way that we think about this data an analytics revolution, it's likely to unfold over the next two decades in a way that produces lawyers that are appropriately prepared and can actually not only survive this revolution, but thrive in sort of the post data analytics revolution world. So I wanna talk a little bit about uh, all of those parts and I wanna de develop uh, the rest of the talk in essentially three segments. First of all, I wanna define my terms. What do I mean when I'm talking about data an analytics and data analytics methods? Second, how do they work? And here I will give an, an extended audience pandering example of how uh, data analytics work. Uh, third, what are the implications of data analytics methods for legal practice? Uh, do these methods threaten a type of a singularity, an existential threat to lawyering, to law students, to law professors? Are we about to become the out of work chauffeurs for the driverless car, all right? And by the way, the answer is gonna be, there is a glass half full aspect to the answer, but there's also a glass half empty that I think we need to be aware of as practitioners, legal educators, and law students. And in fact, the bottom line message I'm gonna give probably, uh, probably applies most to the law students in the audience. So first, what do I mean by data analytics methods? All right, and this, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fess up. This is a catch-all. It's a bit of a gimmicky term, and because it's a, a bit of a gimmicky term, I don't want to fall into the trap of essentially waving my arms and pretending that we all agree on what this means, all right? So here are some ways in which this term is a little bit problematic. 
Uh, one, how is it different than anything that came before, right? I liked it better when it was just regular data. Why is it big data or metadata? Uh, another possibility is people don't really know what it is. They just think it sounds cool, right? I'm looking for a strategy to leverage our core competencies with big data across multiple synergized plat paradigms or something that rhymes, right? Either way, all right? And section three, it's just because what everyone is talking about, right? No one really knows what, <laughs> what data analytics are, but it seems like we should all know what they are. All right, so I need to avoid falling into any of those traps. I'm gonna do the best that I can to do so. My sense is there's probably six traits that data analytics have, um, that, have that I wanna call out and specifically uh, use to, to sort of draw a circle around the field. Using quantitative data, to analyze problems, situating and validating uh, though that analysis with statistical models, um, appreciating that what you're doing a lot of times is predicting things as opposed to testing theories, and that's kind of a deeper point for I think some of the law and social science folks in the crowd to appreciate. Fourth, a willingness to harness greater and greater computing power, and we've seen a lot of that. Uh, fifth, uh, thinking imaginatively about what constitutes new data with that computing power there are a lot of things that didn't historically constitute data that now might. In fact, I'll talk about some of them today. And then finally, using some of those, those increased compu uh, computing uh, capabilities with an expanded version of what constitutes data uh, to really think about um, different methodologies that can be used in empirical uh, scholarship so, and, and analysis. So I'm gonna sort of cover all of these, and on some level, Many of these things are not brand new to the industry, right? The first two have been around for decades, right? And in fact, this is what empirical scholarship is all about. The third and the fourth have, are sort of old. They've been around for a while. I think in some respects, you know, people that are schooled in social sciences, you know, 10 years ago, the term data mining was a bit of a pejorative and, and, and to, to get the idea that you're using empirical methods just to predict things as opposed to test theories. It's a little bit of work you gotta get there, but it's not, uh, it's not entirely new. The last two, I think, are pretty new. I think that, that, that's one of the things that typifies, or two things that really typify uh, what I perceive as the, 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 the more recent um, you know, moves in data analytics, big data, and so forth. And the key thing here is that a lot of lawyerly activities actually lend themselves to these sorts of approaches. Uh, exhibit one, and in fact, many of you who are practitioners in the room will know this, uh, e-discovery has probably been the biggest beachhead for data analytic methods in the law. This has essentially been a driver for what we have seen over the last few years, relate, or at least one of the drivers, related to uh, uh, you know, changing leverage ratios inside litigation firms, the reduced need for, 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 uh, for associates to do uh, some of the discovery work that you know, when I was in law school, you sat you know, 10 associates in a dark room with a bunch of bankers boxes. Now, you do it with one. Uh, by 2019, under some estimates, the, the global size of, of, of e-commerce is supposed to go up to almost $11 billion. Two-thirds of that fully are going to be inside the U.S. And one thing to note about this, some of this, some of this revenue is coming from the sale of software, something that we're not very good at as lawyers. A lot of it's coming through the provision of services, something that we are pretty good at as lawyers. And so I'm going to come back to this a little bit later. All right. So how do they work? Here's my audience pandering example. This is about as pandering as it gets, too. So I want to take as an example CU Law faculty bios. And I've been spending a lot of time with your faculty bios, all right? And what's kind of interesting about this is that faculty bios provide a pretty content-rich source of data that 10 years ago I would have thought, this is a data, right? This is just a bunch of words, all right? But it turns out that now this constitutes a data set, all right? And guess what? The law consists of reams and reams and reams of unstructured textual data. That's why this is such a tempting uh, chops licking target, all right? 
It's also amenable to various types of data analytics approaches, and I'm going to take you through a couple of them. Uh, uh, you know, something called unsupervised learning, where you just try to get patterns and, and, and don't try to instruct algorithms on how to think about, about these documents. But also something called supervised learning, which I think is probably the most promising for data analytics methods in law, where you're actually trying to train an algorithm uh, to guess some type of an outcome, maybe a legal outcome, whether something's in a contract, whether something's in a constitution and so forth. And I'm going to try to do both of those with this crazy example. So I'm going to, I'm going to use the, the, your faculty bios uh, to do two things. First, measure simul similarities among faculty bios, structure, and content. This is kind of my version of a really, really nerdy blind dating service. All right? Who's similar to one another based on their bio and who's not? Second, can I train an algorithm to predict faculty members' characteristics? such as their specialty, are they tenured, are they untenured, what, the, what types of classes do they teach, and so forth. So I will try, during my remaining time, to pull both of these things off, and then talk about some implications. All right, so if you go to the, to the CU Law website, and click on faculty directory, this is what you'll see. 93 names, is it 93 names, Michael? All right, Michael Lindemann, by the way, is sitting here, he's my research assistant at Columbia, but a product of a, an undergrad here at CU. And um, pretty much everything I say over the next five minutes when I say I, I did this and I did this, it's Michael Linneman did this <laughs> and Michael Linneman did that. All right? So let's just pick on a randomly selected person. Christelia, this is your fa faculty bio. You pull this up, it's got a whole bunch of information about you. There you are. All right? So yes, wave for the audience. All right? Articles published, education received, and so forth. All right? What I did over the last, uh, last couple weeks is essentially scrape this information off, put it into a bunch of text-based files for each of the 93 faculty members here, all right? And what we did with that is you can do a bunch of things with that, but one thing you can do, it just seems kind of crazy, is not to pay attention to sentence structure, not to pay attention to, to any things that are juxtaposed to anything else, but just summarize all the different words that are in Cristelia Garcia's uh, bio and everyone else's bio, and essentially try to come up with a concatenation, a list, a bag of words, as it were, that were in everyone else, everyone's bio. And this is what this looks like, all right? I don't pretend to think that you can actually, in the back row, uh, that you can see that, but you probably shouldn't have sat in the back row, all right? <laughs> However, in the, on all these rows, you essentially have all the members of the faculty. I didn't have room to put all 93 people, and each one of these things is a word. Practice, criminal, faculty, um, Aronson, that only appears in one person's bio, <laughs> Professor Aronson's, all right? Financial, all right? And these are all, these are essentially just word counts, all right? Now, I also didn't have enough room to fit all of the columns in because there are 7,000 there or thereabouts of these columns, all right? So this is a gigantic data set, and it's just a bag of words, all right? And I got to tell you, when I started doing stuff in this, in this area, I thought this was just tomfoolery and shenanigans. I really didn't think that it had much probative value, and I was kind of shocked to see that it actually did. All right, so let me sort of take you through a couple of things that you can do with this. And there are way fancier ways to, 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 to do, do data analytics on this type of uh, data set, but this is a pretty common way to do it. So one thing that you can sort of think of is that each one of these rows, which corresponds to a faculty member, Professor Garcia, is kind of like a vector. Do you remember when you were studying that in pre-calc or something like that? You have this vector that holds these different components. And a lot of times what you would do is say, what's the distance between vector A and vector B, right? You're just trying to come up with a distance measure, maybe a Euclidean distance or some other distance measure, right? A squared plus B squared, square root of the whole thing type thing. Remember that? So we could actually do that. We could compare Professor Garcia's maybe to Professor Girding's. Um, uh, bios, basically based on this, on this word count, and say, let's, uh, let's figure out what the distance is. Now, this isn't, you know, this is a two-dimensional picture, so I'd really have to have a 7,000-dimensional picture, but it's the same idea. What's the, what's the distance between the endpoints of those two vectors, all right? And if there's no difference between them, that, that basically means that in, in terms of words and word counts, these are identical documents. Now, they may not be in exactly the same order, but it's a really good signal of, of, of close proximity of these sorts of documents. All right? Another thing to notice 
is that there are certain types of words that seem to distinguish people more than other types of words. For instance, Colorado, it's in all of y'all's um, faculty, capital bios. Law, it's in a lot of them. But a word like financial, all right, it appears once in everyone's, probably because there's a little menu item that says financial aid, right, that you can click on. But then you get down to Girding, you read Girding's bio, it, it, contain, it contains a reference to financial 32 times, all right? <laughs> this, is a, this is a word that is not frequently used across documents, but it's used really frequently in Professor Girding's bio, all right? So sometimes when you're trying to figure out, how you doing, Eric? All right. You got to get rid of the financials, man. Um, so sometimes when you're trying to figure out how to think about these components or these counts, you actually might rescale them, right? To penalize and, and knock down counts that appear everywhere, but then blow them up if they don't occur, occur very often, but are really common in one person or two people's uh, approach. And I did a little bit of that as well. I won't share those disgusting figures with you, all right? But then I, I basically just did this for everyone that's got a bio of more than 700 words, and that's about the median for the faculty, so there's about 30 of you, all right? And said, what's the, what's the similarity between these two? Right? Kind of the inverse of the distance between these two. And this is a table that you also can't read very much, but you can see the color coding, I think. Uh, I just highlighted in pink any two, and, and you would read this almost like one of those old AAA atlases. How far is it from Chicago to Denver, right? You look at the row and column, and you do the same thing here, all right? And you can ask, look, you know, what two people's bios are, are close enough together that they satisfy some criterion that I specify, which is 0.95 here, sort of arbitrarily. And you can see it lights up for some. It always lights up along that, that diagonal, because that's how close is Professor Garcia's bio to Professor Garcia's bio. But the off-diagonal ones are the ones that you kind of think, hey, are there some interesting proximities? Now, some people, Professor Collins, for example, Professor Ramsey, they end up matching up pretty closely with a lot. All right? But there are some that don't match closely with a lot, but match up with each other. For instance, this guy right here, all right? 0.95409, pretty good match. That corresponds to Professor Certain, who's there. Is Professor Brad here? Bert, yeah, so, so, all right, whatever, all right. So this, is a, a, this was essentially one of the closest matches that wasn't sort of a systemic match across all the faculty. I surreptitiously, I'm sorry about this, Harry. I, I surreptitiously emailed um, uh, 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 Professor Certain the other night asking if he, did you know this Brad Bernthal guy? And, Yes, Brad and I are good friends. <laughs> He's done some really terrific work in entrepreneurship academic arena, so good props, <laughs> right? All right? So, I mean, this is obviously a bit of a cherry-picked example, but it's l less cherry-picked than you might think, all right? Uh, this is actually turns out to be a reasonably powerful way to compare text. By the way, you'll notice, Phil, you were probably trying to find, find yours. Uh, Dean Weiser. Dean Weiser didn't really match up with anyone. <laughs> On, on the faculty. That means in part that you've just got a really long bio and they match up worse. And it may just mean you don't have many friends, but that's. <laughs> my wife is the dean at Columbia, and she's only got one friend. Sometimes I don't like to talk to her either. So it's all right. <laughs> all right. So that's, that's an unsupervised learning approach. How could you use these sorts of documents just to compare things for similarities and differences? And by the way, that's essentially the technology that underlies facial recognition, uh, that underlies you know, date matching, that underlies plagiarism programs. It's essentially the same type of technology in all of those circumstances. When you amp it up a little bit, you might want to do more than just compare, but you might want to think about prediction. Right? Can I predict something from the text of a document that I read? All right? And you can start to see how this is going to become uncomfortably close to lawyering, all right? So you can do this as well with the CU BIOS. One of the things that's interesting about the website is the website, in addition to giving these BIOS, it also offers me a classification. Who's in the business law curriculum? Who's junior versus tenured? Who's on the tenure track, either tenured, non-tenured, or other, all right? And these various classifications are things that CU staff basically put together, all right, on their own. So I began to wonder, well, could I use the textual information from those bios to predict? 
Is this person in the business law curriculum or not? Is this person in the constitutional law uh, curriculum or not? Is this person tenured or not tenured, all right, based on essentially the, the text in that document, all right? And it turns out you can. There's one last trick that you've got to use here, and the only reason I'm going to talk about this is that sometimes the details may prove to be important for my punchline at the end. But remember, this is that same matrix. I squunched it up into the corner, but it goes off for 7,000 columns, all right? And that's just a lot. That's a lot of columns. That's more, more than I can possibly fit in my little head to actually do analytics on. And so one of the things that people will tend to try to do here is they'll say, is there any way I can summarize all of those columns in a smaller number of columns? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And it turns out that this is where a lot of work in data analytics has been done recently, right? To try to take those 7,000 columns, and this is my best, best visual representation of squeezing them down to a smaller number of columns. Now, these are variables that are essentially just synthetic variables, all right? This is essentially just taking advantage of the geometric structure of, the, of what these big matrices look like and trying to, to pull as much information as I can and summarize it only in eight columns, all right? Technically, if you're really interested in it, the, what I did here was called a singular value decomposition. And if you're a real tech wonk, which basically means Professor Certain, then you, you'll, know, you'll know what was going on there, all right? But it turns out that this is a big step that, that a lot of times uh, is necessary if you're going to then use these things to predict. And so I did this, and I just sort of formulated these kind of synthetic variables, but the variables do embody the structure of the word counts that are in those 7,000 columns. Not perfectly. I'm going to miss some because I don't have 7,000 columns, but I'm going to get most of the variation here. All right? So they're weird amalgams and combinations of different columns. All right, so what can I do? What if I, I, I said I took those variables and then I tried to basically run a series of regressions? Can I take those variables and predict? You know, where is Professor Garcia's, by the way, you're, you, you're not assigned to any subject matter. I don't know why. You should talk to your, I, so I, I, couldn't, I couldn't use you. You're a false negative in every one of these uh, conditions. All right, um, to, you know, could I assign, uh, you know, a probability that someone is in a particular subject matter, all right? And so I did that. I ran a bunch of these things on six different categories that I was able to find that were, that were coded up and just said, you know, if I, if I know how these things are coded, can I train my little regressions to, to predict whether the person's in that field or not, all right? So here's how it did. And this is, by the way, about an hour, an hour and a half worth of work. The blue bars are essentially uh, the percent of faculty members that I was able to correctly categorize in each one of these fields. Tenure track or, or in ladder versus not, teaches in litigation versus not, in constitutional law versus not, in business law, criminal law, and public interest law, all right? 50% is essentially guessing in the dark, all right? And in all of these, except tenure track ladder, I'm sort of between 80 and 95% percent in terms of classification. And I would say that the sort of the approach we took here was not, that I took here, sorry Michael, uh, was, was, uh, was, was not anywhere close to the, the most sophisticated type of approach one could use. This was essentially an afternoon's worth of work. But, but what caused me when I first was doing a project on, the, on, on this type of stuff to, to, to really sort of take a, to, to give a double take was just how powerful these methodologies can be for predicting things, not only inside your sample, which is what I have here, but even outside your sample on a new faculty member that joins the, 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 the faculty that hasn't been put into the database yet. If I get the bio, can I predict where they're going to teach, all right? And you can kind of see where I'm going to be going on this in terms of its uh, applications to law. All right. That's, that's my pandering example, by the way, all right? I did check off step three, all right? So beyond pandering examples, how can you use this in the context of law? Well, it turns out that there have been, for many years, already a number of applications of data analytics approaches to law. Citation and opinion analysis is a very, very common approach that's been around for over a decade in which you're know, trying, to, trying to get a sense of citation patterns, clusters of precedents, who's citing each other and who's not citing one another. And this, this can be done relatively easily uh, with uh, legal opinions that not only have uh, case citations but also have West Key numbers and things like that. And so it is kind of an interesting area where you sort of say, hey, look, there appear to be two lines of precedent that are rising up that don't seem to be citing each other 
but uh, they're, you know, across these lines, but are citing internally. And that's been around for a while. Um, to try to figure out what arguments get made in a case that give rise to a liability later on, that, uh, that sometimes has been useful as well, or rationales offered in decisions. Document analysis and comparison of documents is a very, very common approach. And in some ways, a project that I ended up doing is a version of this, sort of a cross between this and prediction. Uh, E-discovery is, in fact, just such an example. The, the model now for discovery, if you've got electronic discovery, you put one associate in the room with a single banker's box, and she says, I found five documents that are actually kind of sketchy, that look like they may be a problem. Those five documents then get sent to essentially a data analytics firm that says, let's look at the rest of the reams, the gigabytes of documents, and figure out how many of them are close to, from a distance perspective, these hot documents that one associate has identified. All right? Uh, you can do all kinds of cross-sectional analysis of, of public filings, contracts, law firm effects, what kind of law, you know, w when you see law firms representing someone, what, kind of, what ends up in a contract. I did something a few years ago, which I think got circulated ahead of time, on a particular type of provision in M&A agreements, that's the area that I teach in, uh, which is essentially a force majeure, an act of God provision. Under what circumstances uh, are you likely to see certain types of language in a force majeure provision? These things are heavily negotiated. Those of you who teach or have studied in the business law uh, curriculum will know that. And they tend to have, they're kind of like Swiss cheese. They tend to have certain things that say, okay, you're off if this happens. Those are sort of the affirmative terms. And the exceptions, they say, hey, you're not out, right? We're going to carve this out and say, no, you still have to go through with the deal if one of the following things happen. Things like natural disasters, escalation of hostilities, uh, de disease, pestilence, famine, uh, and so forth, all right? And so it turns out that this set of contracts has garnered so much interest, it's been coded by lawyers. And that coding by lawyers, or the, is a term there, is it not there, can also be used to predict outside of uh, the sample. And this is just a set of, I won't go through what these provisions are, uh, but the bottom line of this is that this is an approach used on a very complex business document, not a, fa a faculty bio, that also delivers pretty good, not quite as good, uh, predictions of uh, whether a provision is present or absent in a very, very long contractual instrument. All right, And I found this to be pretty helpful in my own uh, in my own research, in which pretty much what a lot of M&A attorneys do is ask, what are people doing now? What are people putting in their contracts? What are they not putting in their contracts? And they usually have sent an associate to read a 150-page contract to see if something's in it or not in it. Data analytics approaches can be helpful from that perspective. But I got to say, I think the big kahuna here is predicting outcomes, all right? Can I, for example, take the filed briefs in a case and maybe the last three precedents in that case, and predict, if this thing goes to litigation, is the plaintiff going to win or is the defendant going to win? All right? Um, and it turns out that we are just at the beginning of trying to do that from a data analytics perspective. Uh, but it's not just decisions. Can I predict your litigation risk exposure from a particular practice if you're going to, you know, thinking about putting this safety device in a product or not putting, putting it in a product? Can I predict regulatory or political risk, all right, if you decide to jack up the price of this pharmaceutical? How likely is it that you're going to face political risk later on? All right, these are approaches that are really interesting that these sorts of data analytics approaches may have some bearing on and sort of frighteningly, they're the things that a lot of lawyers think that they do, right? This is what we tell lawyers. We're going to train you to do this stuff. And so if an algorithm may be doing this stuff instead, that gets a little bit scary, all right? And so, so um, it kind of, there's this old kind of, I'm not a law and philosophy person, but there's this old discussion in law and philosophy, me, analytic philosophy, about whether legal structures are kind of like chess, like you're playing chess when you're litigating and adjudicating a case. And Andre Marmer, uh, H.L.A. Hart, uh, Stanley Fish have all sort of written on this topic. And if that's correct, and, and, and Marmer in particular said, yeah, it's kind of like playing chess. If it's like playing chess, I think we got a lot to worry about, all right? Now, this is Deep Blue uh, knocking off Gary Kasparov 10 years ago playing chess. Or, or maybe, so probably isn't like chess. What if it's like that game Go? You guys know? Oh, wait, that happened last week. Or 
our champion. Well, you know, a lot of lawyers are really good at Jeopardy. Maybe it's, maybe it's like Jeopardy. Maybe, well, that's not very good either, right? Um, and, and in fact, Watson um, really creamed some champions in Jeopardy, in Jeopardy. So if we think about law as being these types of systems, things don't look good, folks. They don't look good for us uh, from a profession, all right? And I think that has given rise to some degree of angst among people in the legal profession, all right? We look at the numbers of total LSATs being administered, which, which have been dramatically down, a little uptick projected this year. Or the ratio of lawyers to equity partners in uh, major law firms, which have also been generally declining, a concomitant possibly of not needing as many associates mixed in with the financial crisis, to be sure. Is this an ex existential moment for law? Is this a moment where, and, and some of these technologist types will talk about the singularity occurring, where machine knowledge, this is a little bit apocalyptic, but it's good for a talk, all right, where machine knowledge over, overtakes human knowledge and we start to essentially uh, you know, uh, be overtaken by the androids. Is this, is this a danger? And, and some people have a big fear about this with certain types of, uh, of uh, technologies and, uh, and human activities. Is this the existential moment for law, all right? Are we in a position where we're going to turn into the outer work drivers for what has become a driverless car? And I want to suggest that I'm kind of skeptical, and I'm skeptical for a variety of reasons. It's not because I think these, these methods aren't powerful. I think they're very powerful, all right? But the reason I'm skeptical is that their power emanates from a bunch of sources that pretty much require human interaction, all right, in ways that maybe engineering a bridge don't, all right? So first, legal reasoning in many ways, and this is what you know, those of you who've gone through law school have probably come to realize, there are some elements of legal reasoning that are just irreducibly complex, all right? Think about the, the cases that we spend our time talking about in law school classes, the cases that lawyers spend their time talking about. Marbury, Bu Buick versus McPherson, Brown versus Board, Walker Thomas Furniture, Citizens United, Obergefell, all of these cases are cases that are interesting for two reasons. They were hard, really hard going in, and they kind of maybe possibly changed the way that the law was operating, all right? And when that happens, I would submit that it's pretty unlikely that an algorithmic approach is going to be able to predict that those sorts of events are going to happen or necessarily to be able to adapt to them very quickly when they do happen, all right? Reason number two, well, here's another way to think about it. Another person who's opined on this idea of, of law as chess is Ronald Dworkin, and he wrote famously in 1978, law's not like chess, all right? In chess, if you have a referee that announces in the middle of a final match that there's not some new rule that no one's ever thought of before and therefore player one wins rather than player two wins, that referee will never work again, all right? But if a judge does that in a watershed case, we celebrate it in the classroom, all right? And this fits very, I think, very closely with this idea that law, particularly common law systems, end up gaining their vitality because they change, they adapt, sometimes in ways that don't correlate with where you would expect them to go based on past practices because there's a true regime shift. And algorithmic approaches are not particularly good, at least now, and probably in my lifetime at least, of, of getting there. Second, look, law is going to play a pretty critical role in regulating all those other areas where we really are worried about the singularity event, all right? Uh, and in fact, uh, information privacy, intellectual property, insider trading rules, many of these things are now trying to cope with the fact that, in fact, this may be a real danger in other, in other venues. So almost by definition, law has to play a role, not in, a, in an automated way. It'd be kind of interesting to think about an algorithmic approach to creating regulations to stem the bad consequences of algorithmic approaches it might, might happen, I just don't know for sure. And then the final one, and this is the one that's the most wonky, but I also think it's probably going to be the most germane, and then I'm going to be done. From my perspective, particularly this perspective of trying to predict outcomes, legal outcomes, regulatory outcomes, predictive out, um, political outcomes, 
most of that technology, the best models that are out there from a, from a data analytics predict, uh, perspective are what is known as supervised learning models, all right? And I took you through one when I was trying to predict people's, uh, people's specialty. CU staff basically assigned faculty members, Girding teaches in the business law section, and that's what I essentially used, that designation, to train this model, all right? Practicing lawyers identified those terms inside the M&A agreements that I was then trying to train the algorithm to predict. Practicing lawyers have to identify what those hot documents are so that the e-discovery company can go forward and say, oh, we've uncovered a number of other ones, all right? And I think in law in particular, there's this kind of, there's this usual presumption outside of law that human knowledge and machine learning knowledge are substitutes with one another. But there are a lot of contexts in law in which they can't be substitutes with one another. They have to be complements with one another. That's the only way that things work. And I think this complementarity will persist so long as law has a type of irreducible complexity associated with it. As long as there are precedents that suddenly change, or laws that suddenly change, or cases that are genuinely hard, uh, that's when things like policy questions, theory, uh, uh, other, other normative uh, commitments, value trade-offs are gonna come into play, and it's something that, that algorithmic approaches aren't particularly good at doing. So if I go back to this kind of singularity uh, diagram that I put up earlier, and start thinking about humans and machines as being complements rather than substitutes, I get something like that, all right? Now maybe we're walking around like the Borg and we got machines hooked up to us, but all y'all have, have cell phones right now anyway, right? That's on some level already happened and it's not as, as frightening as it might otherwise be. My sense is that, that, that humans plus machines, at least in the context of law, are gonna be able to do far more than any of the, uh, than either of them independently, all right? And so here's the kicker, and this is where I'm gonna sum, uh, basically conclude. That green line is probably good for people who are into data analytics, and it's probably good for people who are studying law, so long as you are adequately prepared to interface with what is likely to be kind of an emerging you know, lines of practice that meaningfully intersect traditional law with data analytic methods, all right? And there's probably some training that you as students can engage in that firms might want to encourage and that professors might want to, to think about delivering. Because if you don't develop those requisite skills, you're probably gonna be on the red line, all right? And the one thing I worry a little bit about is that things like, you know, just, just general knowledge of coding and, and, uh, and data analytics, I'm not so sure that this second set of skills is something that professors, tenured professors, have, have really fully internalized. It's not clear to me that practicing lawyers have fully internalized this yet either, all right? There are people out there that have, all right? There's, you can find no sh uh, shortage of websites and publications that talk about lawyers who code having a special niche in the market. I think that niche is gonna grow larger and larger. Uh, one cause of concern, about a year and a half ago, some colleagues of mine in Berkeley and I did a, a, a survey of, pract of, uh, of transactional attorneys. It was national in scope. It had mainly from the West Coast and East Coast, but it had lawyers from just about every state. And we essentially um, asked them, and this was in context of the California bar uh, developing practical skills and competencies uh, 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 requirements for admission to the bar. And so we wanted to get a sense from practicing transactional attorneys what sorts of preparation would you think are important for a lawyer in his first two or three years of practice? And much to uh, the dismay of my co-authors of this survey, I insisted on putting predictive coding and data analytics into the survey, all right? And there were probably 13 or 14 things that we looked at. Here were the results, all right? And they are listed as critically important in blue, somewhat important in red, marginally important in green, Largely, um, actually, you know what, I think I got that. Yeah, I got that exactly right. Largely irrelevant in purple. And I've ranked those from um, most critically important to least critically important. And that last category is computer programming, architecture, and predictive coding, all right? In fact, you, you look at the, the group of people that list this as critically or, uh, important or somewhat important, it's somewhat, it's a, a smidge less than 10% of the 330 attorneys that we interviewed. Now, I guess one could read this as, you know, Tally, you're just out to lunch. This is not where the, where the profession is going. But I gotta tell you, I resist that. And I resist that because 
I really don't have much of a stake in becoming a law and technology person, right? The reason I, I, I sort of grabbed onto this, to, to this wagon was because I found it to be helpful in my own practice and my own consulting, all right? It turns out that after that M&A paper got published, I was asked to be an expert about whether particular terms in M&A agreements turn out to be you know, standard within the market or very atypical within the market. Evidently, there are some lawyers who care deeply about those sorts of questions. And I, I think that that's probably becoming increasingly true with, with, with people who practice and people who are in academia, uh, though I don't know it's go whether it's going as fast as it probably could or should, all right? And so if I had to say what's the biggest existential threat that's posed by the data analytics revolution, I think it's probably ourselves. Um, either by uh, not being aw aware of how quickly these applications are growing, uh, how they are likely to affect both litigation and transactional practice far into the future, or even if you understand that, sort of playing the chicken little role and say, oh, well, there's nothing that we can do about it. At some point, the robot, sometimes the, the Borg is just going to take over and, we, and we'll be out of work. I think that gets it wrong as well, right? In order to sort of think about these sorts of, these sorts of approaches having legs and being helpful, you have to think about machine learning and human learning as being complements rather than substitutes. That's not necessarily the case in other fields, but I think it's almost inescapable in law. All right, so that shows, that in turn poses a challenge for a bunch of us, all right? If you're a legal practitioner or a firm, I think you're gonna have to be thinking about retooling for what this future is gonna look like. There are some firms that have already started to do that, to sort of set up their own data analytics, uh, you know, enterprises inside the company. Firms themselves are vast repositories of exactly this type of data. Uh, they tend to silo it, they tend not to, to try to organize it, and uh, if, they were, if they were to try to do so, they would, they would discover that they're sitting on a, a resource that's far more vast than they understand. All right, and this doesn't necessarily mean fewer lawyers, right? Particularly if if DA methods ramp up, you're actually you could mean more need more lawyers, but those would have to be appropriately trained lawyers. Law faculty should bring these techniques into the classroom a little bit more, and this is going to be a hard egg to crack. The tenure process is a hard egg to crack, all right, and uh, and so this may ultimately involve different types of hiring and staffing decisions, uh, but it seems clear to me that, uh, that law faculties need to do some of that work themselves. And then finally, if you're a law student, I don't think you want to be waiting for firms or your faculty to adapt. You've got three years here, probably most of you in the room have one and a half years left here, right? Uh, this is an amazing opportunity for you to, to you know, tool up right now, right? This is the moment where you can eat your broccoli and it's way harder to eat your broccoli when you're in practice and you're trying to get client memos out. So uh, if you have the opportunity, think about maybe, maybe honing, honing your skills a little bit in, in either programming or, uh, or statistics or just kind of getting a little bit of a set. You don't have to be a master coder to appreciate how this, this technology is gonna affect the profession, but it does help at least to have some familiarity with it. It will at the very least uh, distinguish you from others uh, in the field, all right? And the worst thing that you can do is simply choose to be a driverless car and not do anything at all, all right? So that, with that, that's the end of my, uh, my remarks. Happy to take Q&A. And uh, our tradition is to call on a few students. We're not afraid to uh, volunteer you if you don't volunteer yourselves. So you have the back row. On your applying to lawyers, um, the final thing you said was that one of the things we've realized computers don't do very well is this type of value-based thinking or algorithm. Um, they don't do value-based thinking very yeah. well. So similarly in chess, we've learned that the ch computers are tactically flawless, but they undervalue some positional type weaknesses. So the analogy there would be when applying something like the doctrine of foreseeability, at what point do we think that computers can't assess those values? Or maybe an equitable doctrine in family law, like for the, <clears throat> for the interest of the child. So my question to you is, do you see these value judgments as a glass ceiling, or is this something that inevitably Skynet catches up? That's a great, that's a great question. I'm, I'm guessing from the text of your question, your name is Jordan. Okay. No, I'm just kidding, because you, you introduced me yourself to me. <laughs> um, 
it was worth a shot, right? <laughs> so, so this is a great, so this is a great question. All right. So, the, so one of the claims I have made and and did not defend, and Jordan I think is correct in calling me out on it, is that a lot of times hard legal questions are hard because they become value judgments. What's more important in a particular circumstance? Economic efficiency or political legitimacy or distributional justice, all right? Um, by the way, Jordan, what is the answer to that question? Yeah, so, so I think that actually, uh, this is gonna sound very law professor-like, but I think that is my answer to your question as well. One of the things that's very tough about those cases is the incommensurability of those types of trade-offs that you're navigating, right? Can we rank those various types of, of value judgments against one another? Probably not, all right? Do, do the revealed uh, rankings of those value judgments or trade-offs that society places upon them, sometimes articulated through judicial opinions, do those change over time? Probably they do, right? See the Lochner era of cases, right? Can we predict when that's gonna happen? I have no idea how I would go about doing that, all right? So one of the things that I, 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 where I still think the chess uh, analogy fails is this is a question of strategic weighting. Uh, within a set of rules that's pretty, sta and trade-offs that's pretty static over time, right? The rules of chess, I think I put it up here on a slide, they haven't changed since around 1500, some very minor changes in the mid-19th century. But most of the rules of chess have been, have been in place ever since about 1550, all right? And so that's a type of system in which the underlying trade-offs they're always going to be there, and what you need to be doing is sort of trying to calibrate your algorithm to take advantage of them more effectively. But the sands of legal doctrines and precedents shift continually, all right? That's one thing that we often like to brag about when we're, when we're, you know, when we're being excessively jingoistic about a, a common law tradition, right? That, in fact, it's got that type of flexibility that the system, yeah, even though it adheres to some traditions of, of, of precedent, might move away from that if there are strong policy reasons to do so, if our trade-off of values has morphed in ways that no longer make that line, that previous line of prece precedent something that we want to continue with. So I guess we could wonder about how we want to play through, you know, whether it's possible in theory to think of a way to predict when value judgments themselves are likely to shift and not to shift. It is a problem that is orders of magnitude harder than chess orders of magnitude harder than three-dimensional modeling, and something that I think we still haven't figured out. Certainly the Republican Party hasn't figured it out this year. And, and, and it really is one of these things where it may be the case that eventually we're gonna reach a point in time where that can be an algorithmic computation, but we are so far from that that it's, it's, it's even hard to conceive, unlike, say, you know, fluid dynamics, where that may actually happen relatively quickly. But good question. Other questions? Yeah. So I very much appreciate the way in which you've encouraged us to think about the complementary nature of machine learning and human learning. And it makes me think also of how we often think with human learning or human decision making, the ways in which cognitive bias interject themselves. And I wondered if you could expand more on how you see data analytics helping push against that and how you see data analytics becoming infected by it. And are you worried about more of one direction than the other? Yeah, so I, this is a nice question. Um, one, when I'm not, um, I don't know, my, my day job, I actually do more things involved with, uh, with behavioral economics and, and uh, cognitive biases. And, and there, I guess, let me, let me take both of those, those, those points of view. Let me go in reverse, all right? Uh, so one thing that you will, you will see that I was sort of pushing within this context is the idea that algorithmic approaches are not gonna be particularly good at predicting things unless they have some sort of, a, some sort of a, a training database on which to calibrate themselves. So you sit lawyers down and you say, okay, here are the arguments offered by the plaintiff and defendant. Which one looks more persuasive? Which one looks less persuasive? And those folks will say, I think the plaintiff, I think the defendant, you get a nice distribution. You vary the facts a little bit. If you get enough of a, a large enough of a training database, not only can you predict how those, those, those cases in the sample come out, but you might even be able to predict how they'll come out outside. If people themselves are prone to cognitive biases, that poses perhaps 
a problem with this approach, all right? Certainly, if you were thinking, hey, listen, I really want people's assessment about what, whether something is going to happen, and it has to be an unbiased assessment, or else the underlying information isn't interesting to me, or it isn't as helpful to me, then this poses a real problem, all right? And you might try to figure out, are there ways that I can either de-bias or correct for that bias, having them do something that is similar in which I kind of know what the correct answer is and try to figure out whether there's skew in one direction or another in the way that I've presented the, the issue to people. On the other hand, I guess it depends on what you're trying to predict, all right? So if I'm pr trying to predict how a jury's gonna vote, I guess I don't want to de-bias people, right? I want them to experience the, the, the input just like a jury would experience it, and that's in fact part of what I'm trying to uncover. The thing that gets a little bit frustrating, and I will confess that it's frustrating to me, and I mentioned this in passing, is that down deep, and most of us who teach in law schools who have been affected on, in some way by sort of some version of social science, be it psychology, political science, economics, you sort of think in ther terms of theories. Oh, how would a prospect theory sort of you know, predict people would behave in this way or the other? How would a, you know, a, a, you know, a, you know, just a standard you know, expected utility hypothesis predict behavior? And then you do a horse race between them. These algorithmic models are not very good at, adju at, ad at adjudicating, but they're prediction models, right? You notice I didn't report any coefficient estimates, which is the, t the key thing that you'll usually do when you're trying to test a theory. I didn't do any of that here because the coefficients were on variables that I can't interpret for you. I just don't know what they are. All right, and so that's one area I think of dissonance. And, and it's, not a, it's not a trivial area, right? If you are not interested in prediction, if you're interested in to what extent is the law reflecting efficiency commitments or debiasing commitments, then I think you, you've got to include something else, all right? And, 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 it, and it's not that these methods should be put to a side, but you need to then tr sort of combine them with some way that's, that's, that's more capable of testing theories. I think I got both both halves. Yeah. All right. Good. Neil. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm good. Um, so you were talking about the legal algorithms um, in existence that are based on the existing rules and then predicting, and then you listed some examples of cases that are actually um, like rule changers. Is there a way to create an algorithm that actually predicts what circumstances it takes to change the rules so that you could more effectively change the rules? Yeah, yeah, you know, I, so, so, so here, I, let, me, let, me, let me rephrase this. I don't want to be too, this is also kind of an annoying law professor move. Let me rephrase the question to something you didn't ask, but I think this is what you're asking. <laughs> so is there a way that I could predict when a precedent is vulnerable? Right? When, uh, you know what, this thing might go, right? The same sex marriage thing, they're on the verge of, 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 of moving in, in that direction. I think probably some data analytic methods might do that, all right? But they would be of a, of a particular stripe, all right? And it would more, it look more like the following Scalia just passed away, and the median vote on the Supreme Court has moved. We have some scores on how. Uh, you know, Supreme Court, um, you know, voters are likely to vote, and I can make a prediction based on precedents that are out there that were close votes, what now might be in play again, all right? One thing that I'm, I, I don't think these, are, and, 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 and a lot of those Supreme Court voting scores, they were actually developed with very, very similar tools to what I'm talking about here. There's this very well-known set of metrics called Martin Quinn scores. They're essentially some version, uh, slightly different, but it's, but it's a pretty close version to what I was talking about here. The, the thing that's going to be harder to predict is, oh, the Supreme Court, th this precedent is vulnerable because, uh, you know, issues relating to distributive justice are just becoming way more important now. And, um, and it's just going to cause a sea change in sentiment, right? Now, you see that argument pretty frequently right now, and it may or may not be true. Uh, that one is one that's harder to do. You could maybe try to attack it by, by you know, doing these same kind of analytic approaches on press coverage, on op-eds, to get a sense of political mood. And so I wouldn't say, now, there's, there's not a way that that could happen. I would expect it would be much noisier than, than the, the, the more directly sort of, you know, geometric move on, you know, where, what sort of judges are we likely to get and, uh, and how is the changing of the guard affecting them. Uh, I, don't, I don't think uh, that, uh, that data analytic methods are, are, are worthless by any means in trying to predict change. It's just that predicting, you know, the, the, these big sea changes occur in ways 
that I don't think a lot of people can, can you know, predict when they're going to happen. Maybe some, there are some advocates thinking that they will happen, but they're very, very difficult to assess. And then to try to assess exactly what their implications are going forward, that's maybe a combination of statistics and judgment, right, about, about human judgment that's still a pretty complex thing. So it's possible at some point we might get there, but I think it's, a, it's you know, in this kind of version of the long run in which we're all dead. So I think we have to give, um, let's say, two more questions. Um, Harry, you raise your hand, and I raise yours. Let's let you guys get the last word. So Harry, Harry's question comes to us via an algorithm he just wrote. <laughs> yeah, here on a subroutine. That. Um, yeah. So thanks. Really interesting talk. Uh, so one aspect I'd like to get your opinion on: a lot of machine learning methods encode their models in models that are not comprehensible to people. So in other words, they do really good predictions, but we can't actually understand why they are doing what they're doing. And that, you know, in the sciences, that might be okay. Uh, do you have any thoughts about this in law where we often require explanations and reasons for things and not just output functionality? Yeah, nice question. So one thing I didn't talk about, and you may be referring to, is neural nets, which which um, I've not done a lot of work in, but the little work I've done has basically made me not want to understand it. Um, and and it's and and so some of these algorithms can be so complex that the people that have wrote them, that have written them, actually have a hard time, you know, explaining what's going on inside the algorithm. But they predict extremely well. Um, uh, I guess the question of do, do we have to make that accessible to others would hinge on the venue. It is unremarkable to see, say, expert opinions in front of judges in which the expert is saying, oh, I've got some computer model and lights are blinking and it spits out this is the correct answer, in which the judge not only doesn't want to listen to it, but may actually grant a Daubert motion to, to exclude this expert's uh, testimony as being something that would be essentially impossible to replicate and not subject to the standards of the field. And that may or may not be true, and there is kind of a big fight, I think, in, a, in the AI community about exactly this sort of an issue. Um, if I were presenting that same algorithm to a hedge fund manager, I'm not so sure, right? I need to convince the hedge fund manager that the track record of this, say, neural net predictor, this classifier, is a good is a good one, and that it adapts well, and uh, and that may you know be enough to, to to make things happen. And so then you sort of say, okay, let's go in the middle. Suppose you're a law firm that's advising a client about the client's legal risk if it stops giving out coffee in the staff lounge. All right, or whatever, right? I don't, I don't mean to make light of it, but just some, pra some change in practice. Um, that's one that I guess I, I, I'm not sure I would necessarily expect the onus of um, evidentiary standards to be placed on the decision-making structure. There's a kind of a deeper question about what happens if that decision to discontinue the practice then goes into court and it was based on this predictive model, how does the court deal with that? And I think that's actually quite a hard question, right? Because at that point, we're not trying to admit, you know, admit this under the standards of admission for expert testimony, but just was this a reasonable you know, basis on which to make your decision? And there, you know, if it's predictive, there's a lot of social science that ties its, you know, that, that essentially ties its ma to, to the mass of predictability and falsifiability. And so, you know, I would be prepared to argue that that should be um, something that, that a defendant, say, or even a plaintiff could point to and say, yeah, it was reasonable to rely on this predictive model. All right? But interesting question, and I haven't thought that much about it other than kind of just now. Aya. Um, so you definitely had me at shameless pandering, <laughs> but you definitely lost me at law professor. Ah, yes. <laughs> so, I almost took that out, by the way, but yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess I just want to push back a little uh, on that a little bit in your sense. I mean, I sort of agree with you, like, learning about big data seems like a fun thing to do and may maybe some of the intellectuals, but I don't know, it's like interesting and everybody should learn that. But when you make a claim that law faculty are not correctly distributing sort of the information that they're giving out, and there's not a correct distribution of sort of law professors who are engaged in one kind of 
Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great question, and it's a fair question. And I think the, um, and I won't give a pandering answer. I'll try to give an honest answer. Yeah, that's right. So, so uh, let me draw an analogy uh, to, say, accounting. Accounting for lawyers, all right? Now, there aren't many law schools that actually have a full-time faculty member that teaches accounting for lawyers. It's, it's really hard. Yeah, so, but there, if you actually survey law schools, it's really hard to do that. And then part of the reason, I guess, is the distributional choice. I worry that the commitment that, you know, many law schools, including some that I have worked at, have, have placed on that, on that area of emphasis is actually going to do damage to some of the students when they go into practice. They're just not going to have the preparation that is necessary if they're going to go into a particular area of business law practice. Now, it does not follow. So I actually think, yeah, we should probably be hiring more accounting for lawyers type, type folks. And accounting ended up sort of in the middle of that range. It was a little bit of, uh, you know, towards the top, but it wasn't at the top of that range. Does that mean that I should force all my faculty members to teach accounting? No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that I should do so any more than I should force all my faculty members to teach prospect theory or to teach history or to teach philosophy or to teach psychology. Uh, does it suggest that it may make sense to have faculty who are on board uh, for um, helping prepare students for that if you believe me that in fact this is going to play a larger and larger role in the practice of law in the future? And if you don't, by the way, then then you know, you can pretty much ignore everything else that I said, all right? Um, uh, but the thing that, you know, and, and I also, you know, confess to the fact that, look, when I've got major senior partners coming back and saying, ah, oh, we poo-poo, you know, uh, predictive coding and programming, I worry a little bit about it. I will also say, however, that when I took my, my summary results to the California bar in March of 2015, uh, and gave a presentation to them and said, look, one thing that's a little mysterious to me is how few of these senior partners care about things like predictive coding. It, it's, it's, you know, I would think the California Bar might be interested in trying not only to, pro uh, to produce a lawyer who's really good for 2015 standards, but is also pretty good for 2025 standards. It won the day. And that actually got, if you look at the, Cali it's not been approved yet by the Supreme Court of California, but if you look at their suggested set of courses for skills and competencies, that's one of the things that made it in. Now look, faculty hiring always involves distributed choices, and I, and I think it would actually impoverish a law school to focus on one thing, all right? I just don't think that makes sense. I would encourage, however, if a law school had someone in-house who was really good at some of those methods, for other faculty members to think, all right, is there a meaningful way that I might be able to consult with this person to think about um, you know, how, how students might explore some of these approaches? It's, it's kind of what we do. It's we, we try to prepare students for the profession as best we understand it when they enter it. All right, thank you so much for a very <laughs>